This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 835, recorded on November 26, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon Despommier. Hello there, Vincent and Brianne. I know you're going to introduce her. The weather outside is uh, typical um, late fall, early winter type stuff with lots of wind. And we had a little bit of rain this morning and there's lots of clouds and it's not so warm. And, um, you know, it's going to be winter soon. If it isn't, December 21st is winter, right? That's right. Also joining us from Madison, New Jersey. Actually not, but Brianne Barker. <laughs> Hi, it's great to be here. Um, I am currently joining you from upstate New York at my parents' house. Uh, and w- speaking of winter, it is certainly winter here since we're in the lake effect snow belt. Uh, it is uh, 32 Fahrenheit, zero Celsius, and we've got lake Ooh. effect snow. Burr. You have snow. Oh, cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I see. I kind of see white out the window, but you never know, right? It could yeah. be bright. Very good. So, Dixon, today, you know, if you have an iPhone, uh, it periodically gives you pictures from a long time ago, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So right. this morning, it <laughs> gave me a picture of Dixon Uh-oh. from November twenty sixth, which you know is right, twenty twelve. Wow. Whoa. It's a picture they took of you holding up a glass. Item that looks like a nurse cell in a way, right? That's that's right. It did have a resemblance to a nurse cell. My wife and I were in Venice. Lucky us. Uh, I spotted this piece of um, Moreno glass, and I was struck by the uh, similarities of the form to a nurse cell with uh, a trichinella worm in the middle of it, and I bought it. wasn't cheap, <laughs> but um, I kept it as a souvenir to to just remind me of the fact that that's what I used to do my research on. That's one of the things you're going to keep, I presume. It's sitting on your desk at Columbia, by the way. Yeah, I will keep it. I will keep that. That that doesn't take up much room no matter where you're at. When I left, I saw it on the desk and I thought, uh, so tomorrow Dixon and I are going to go clean out his space. Right. And um, I have a dumpster being sent. (laughs) Got a melancholy kind of a visit tomorrow. It'll be okay, Dixon. I'm sure. My wife would like to join us, too, because maybe she wants to take some of that stuff home. Uh, she's perfectly welcome, and we can get some scotch if you'd like. No, no, no. That's fine. That's fine. I know. It's 10 a.m. It's too, it's too <laughs> early. <laughs> not, not when we finish, it won't be. But, but you can toast to your excellent career with your scotch at the end. We could. We could do that. If, uh, yeah. I, I, I wouldn't trade my life for anything. I, I had a wonderful life. I, I still do, but I mean, I had a wonderful academic life, I should say. And uh, I, I, I will continue to have a wonderful academic life, I hope. Well, you should hang out with the, the, these podcasts here, and then you can continue to think about science, Dixon. Well, you know I will. And um, I'll, I will continue to teach at Fordham uh, when the uh, time permits. So the other day, Dixon. Yes. I, so I, I do this uh, this online course, and one of the participants was is in Madison Wisconsin, and he was talking about a red, R-E-D-D. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I said, I know from Dixon what a red is. <laughs> That's right. And I said, didn't you, put it, didn't you write a story called The Red? Well, I, I've attempted a novel at that uh, topic. Yes, I have. Uh, you're right. I read parts of it. You did, and uh, you actually liked some of it. <laughs> yeah, I did. I did. But you, you said you're never going to publish it, right? That does. That's not true. I'm, um, I'm still interested in having that happen, but... Uh, I I really do need somebody with expertise in editing to uh, go through it and um, make sure that all the dates match and all that all that other stuff that you can lose track of as an author. Mm. But uh, editors never never miss <laughs> the good ones at least. Well, maybe there's an editor listening who will volunteer. Uh, you know, they, no, they get paid big bucks for this stuff. This they is, get paid uh, big bucks, yeah? They do, actually. Yeah. They do. They get paid thousands of dollars to review, review manuscripts because it's the author's impetus that starts the process and uh, yeah. the editor responds. Well, you should find one, Dixon. Well, I've been looking, but I haven't found one that I like yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's, that's important. You need to like them. You do. 
throughout November, December, and January, all the donations you make to Parasites Without Borders will be matched and given back to Microbe TV. So if you go to ParasitesWithoutBorders.com, click the donate button, uh, that will happen, whatever you give. And your donations are tax deductible because Parasites Without Borders is a 501c3, as is Microbe TV. Newly, a recently minted 5013C. So that means all of you who are donating via PayPal or Patreon, yeah, you uh, your donations are U.S. federal tax deductible. And um, I, I have also uh, an incentive for you. If you donate $1,000 or more through the end of 2021, I will send you an autographed copy Principles of Virology, Fifth Edition, no charge. My goodness! And wow! I will write. I will write whatever you want me to write in it. <laughs> Except I will not write. I am wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you would like me to write that. So, uh, if you'd like to do that, I'm going to set up a web page to do that. But meanwhile, you could send an email to Vincent at microbe.tv. Good stuff. And congratulations this, on the 501c3. I'm not sure I've seen you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think you haven't, um, we haven't been on since it happened. Is that true? I thought you were on with a Friday with me, actually. Right? That was the last time you were on. It was a Friday. It was a Friday. Well, let's take a look. Microbe.tv. We have, <laughs> uh, what do you think of the title Grand Theft Kinesin? That was pretty funny. I was pretty excited <laughs> to see that. <laughs> Uh, Dixon, it's all about a herpes virus that takes a, a motor protein from the cell and puts it into its particle. Oh, how funny. How funny. So it steals it. So Alan, of course, came up with Grand Theft. Naturally. <laughs> uh, I think you were on Heavy Metal Flu Fighters, weren't you? Yeah, Brian? that was my title. That was right. No, no, that was not Brienne. That's right. That was another good one. I like that very much. Um, let's see. Where's, where's Brienne on 830? Um, no. So you haven't been on for a while. I haven't been on for a while. I've had quite a lot going on. Yeah, it's okay. No worries. Uh, but good to have you back. And yes, I think you were, have not been on since we got our 501c3. So that's very exciting because, <laughs> Dixon, I, are you playing TWIV? I was trying to find the most recent episode I was on and I hit play by the accident. The answer is no. No, nah, that's okay. I'll take I wouldn't care. know how to do that. <laughs> All right, we have three um, uh, pieces for you today, all having to do, I would say the theme today is antibodies, right? Uh -huh. Against SARS-CoV-2 uh, in, in one way or another. And the first is actually an editorial published in Science by Jeffrey Gerber and Paul Offit, who are both uh, at the oh, yes. University of uh, Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And of course, Paul has been on TWIV. Um, and this is uh, an editorial about kids. COVID-19 vaccines for children. As you know, uh, earlier this month, EUA given to uh, Pfizer's mRNA vaccine for kids 5 to 11 years of age. Uh, and in case you were wondering, that's 28 million kids, 5 to 11 years of age in the U.S. I didn't know that. And they point out right away, surveys show that 42 to 66 percent of the parents of these children are hesitant about vaccinating their children. I found course. that statistic just amazing. That's so high. Isn't it though? It's so high. So you know what I'd like to know, I'd like to know of those parents that are against vaccination for whatever reasons, when they were children, did they get vaccinated? It's a good question. Because, because this is a movement that's only gained momentum over the last, let's say 20 years, but uh, most parents are older than that. Yeah. So they, their parents did express the same doubts of public health related issues as uh, this generation, apparently. It's a good question. Love um, to see a survey on that. I don't know about that. Anyway, they'd say without vaccination, it's like that almost everyone, including these kids, are going to be infected at some point in their lives with SARS CoV 2. And so the question is, and that's what they address in this editorial what's worse, vaccination or natural? Infection. Yeah, and, and I so speaking then, to that, they have ahead. this lovely quote, kind of in the middle of the page, that I think addresses that exact thing so well. About a choice not to get a vaccine is not a risk-free choice; rather, it's a choice to take a different and more serious risk. Um, and I think right, it summarizes right. that exact question that you're you're making so well. 
uh, Vincent. Absolutely. And then they go on to point out that COVID is for sure a childhood illness. So many people say, oh, it doesn't affect children. That's Wrong. Right. Now, early in the outbreak, fewer than 3% of cases were in uh, children. Today, over 25%. Daniel Griffin says that every week. Uh, over 6 million kids have been infected with the virus, including 2 million between the ages of 5 and 11. So that particular age that we're talking about here. We, At we the might, end of October. Uh, we might want to think about that sentence about children accounted for fewer than 3% of cases early, and now they're more than 25%. And we should remind people that that is because the others are vaccinated. It's not That's as right. though this virus right. has somehow changed to impact children. It's because we've stopped infection in others. And so now the leftover infections are happening among children because those children are not vaccinated. And so that is exactly you know, in exactly. and of itself a exactly. pretty obvious to me statistic about the importance of vaccination and how useful right. it is. Here. Yeah, but Brianne, remember that's science. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know. The scientists say, you know, as soon as that phrase pops up, everybody glass, glasses over, you know, and yeah, I've heard that problem. before, that sort of thing. That's really too it's a bad. Problem. It's a real problem. It is. Um, it is. So at the end of October, 100,000 children per week were getting infected in the U.S. And tens of thousands have been hospitalized. A third of them without any pre-existing medical conditions. Many of them have gone into the ICU and uh, 700 have died. And, and listen to this. That makes COVID among the top 10 causes of death in U.S. children. Wow. COVID. No wow. child has died from vaccination, on the other hand. Wow. So these are all good talking points when you're and, – and, and do it calmly, folks. Uh, I have to – repeat Daniel's quote, quote for the week. The, the episode hasn't, well, as you, when you hear this, the, the, uh, his episode will have been published, but we can disagree without being disagreeable. Oh yeah. That's, that's an old one. That's, that's. It's RBG. It's Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Ah. All right. Now, so those are the numbers. No question that this is a childhood illness. The other is many people are concerned that the Pfizer uh, mRNA vaccine was not adequately tested in young children, right? Because they did a safety study of 2,400 children between 5 and 11 years of age. And some people feel that, that that's enough. And so they say, okay, this, this study was actually done when Delta had become dominant, the Delta variant. Vaccine efficacy against any kind of COVID was 90%. That's pretty darn good. And for those of you who say it's not 95, you're lucky to have 90, folks. Most vaccines aren't that good. That is absolutely right. Way back absolutely in the beginning, right. we were hoping for a vaccine that might be 50% efficacious. That's right. right. That's right. The FDA had said, we'll be okay with 50% or greater. And I think getting 90s in the first few kind of spoiled everyone, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. But then they say, okay, even though this was 2,400 kids, the phase three study in adults was 40,000 people. Yes. And so maybe you're concerned about myocarditis, right, given the small size of this study in children. And so they, he, he, they point out in post-authorization studies, um, myocarditis occurred in about five per million individuals receiving mRNA vaccines. Uh, and um, maybe one in 10,000 in young men specifically. But they say, and this is interesting, context is important. Vaccine-associated myocarditis has been relatively mild and self-limiting, which is different from the cardiac effects you get with COVID or multi-system inflammatory syndrome, which often require critical care. Um, furthermore, in Israel and in the U.S., the incidence of myocarditis in children 12 to 15 years of age who get the mRNA vaccines is less than that in the 16 to 25-year-old age group getting those vaccines. And finally, because the dose of Pfizer's uh, vaccine for 5 to 11-year-olds is 
one third of that, they say myocarditis will likely be uh, even rarer. So if you're worried about myocarditis from the vaccine and you make that a choice, it's not a good choice because myocarditis from COVID is much more frequent and much more severe. But they say then uh, myocarditis is just part of this whole whole thing. If you're doing a risk-benefit analysis and they say children have to go to school, they have to have social and emotional development. And this has been interrupted since the beginning uh, of the outbreak. You know, that's right. uh, that's right. over a million students have been disrupted. I, and I'm that's, so glad they, they made and, these points. Uh, yeah, it's important, right? Because people perhaps don't think of them, but they say, you know, disruption of school is more harmful than any vaccine side effect. Remember that kids have mental health issues, widening of education gaps. They're not learning, uh, decreased physical activity, and these, remember, all disproportionately affect uh, people of color, indigenous people, individuals of lower socioeconomic status, because they're already disadvantaged to begin with. And then you get more inequities as, as a result. Um, and they also say that children live with adults and they could pass on infection to them. And then the adults can get really harmed by the infection right. if they're not That's vaccinated. Right. And this is a, one that really caught my eye. Uh, we, we need to protect our populations in different countries because this virus is going to be with us for a long time, probably forever. And they say vaccinating ch all children against SARS-CoV-2 could be among the most impactful public health efforts the U.S. has seen in decades. This is the future of the world, the kids, right? Right. <laughs> need to keep them healthy. Yes. And then the next paragraph is just so good. <laughs> Go ahead. You can tell us. Sure. Brianne. So they point out that most children do experience um, asymptomatic or mild disease, a small fraction of whom will get sick and even a smaller fraction will die. But then they point out this is why children are vaccinated against influenza, meningitis, chickenpox, and hepatitis. And the key frame, yeah, yeah. the key point here, none of which even before vaccines were available, killed as many as SARS-CoV-2 per year. So we right. vaccinate against all of these other things routinely, um, and SARS-CoV-2 has sort of even larger impact on children. Um, and so if we're going to continue vaccinating against all those things, then we need to be vaccinating against SARS-CoV-2 as well. We can't just say SARS-CoV-2 doesn't have an impact on kids. Exactly. Yeah, that's a very powerful point. Vincent, uh, in your opinion, maybe not an opinion, maybe you know or don't, the, how many people in the United States do you think are still virgin with regards to either being vaccinated or having been infected? So I, currently the fully vaccinated is 59% of the U.S. population, right? That's, right, that's so it's 330 latest. million people altogether, right? The U.S. is 330 million people. Um, I don't know how many people have been infected, right? But, because but now the people that are being infected are mostly unimmunized un un people. That's correct. That's correct. So of that pool of unimmunized people, how many of those are still either not infected or, of course, they're not vaccinated either? How many more people need to be infected before we have total exposure either to a vaccine or to the infection? It must be a lot, Dixon, because there's yeah. still, in some states, exactly. big, big numbers, right? Exactly. I mean, it's here, astounding. 4,000 infections a day. Is that correct here in New York? Wait a minute. No, seven-day average in the, in uh, is this New York? This is the U.S. Seven-day average is 1,200 cases. That's really not a lot. Um. I just want to make sure. Yeah, that's no, that's New York City. Sorry, oh, <laughs> it's twelve hundred cases. It's still not a lot. There are eight million people who live in New York. So, just, all of the cases um, in the U.S. November twenty third, uh, seven day average is ninety six thousand every right. week. It's a lot of people, but you know, with a big population, a few percentages, a lot of people. Yeah, so sure, sure. These are sure. all mostly unimmunized people. Um, That's but right. as Daniel pointed out, the hospitalization rate is much lower overall uh, than uh, it was, say, a year ago. Right. Because a lot of people are vaccinated. Yeah, 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 yeah. I hear so, you. 
So overall, how many cases have been 2.7 million? Is that? No, that's not right. That's just for the past. What's the total number of cases for the U.S. for the pandemic? Does anyone I can have that off hands? I'm just curious. Um, all right, 258 million. That's worldwide. In the U.S., what is it? Hmm. 49 million, Dixon. 49 million. And you know, that's an underestimate as well. Exactly, so let's say exactly, it exactly. could be a fourfold underestimate, which means as many as 200 million people exactly. could have been infected. And so if we vaccinated 60% of 330 million, how much is that? Yeah, that's right. It's like uh, about, let's say, 160 million. That, that would be half. Um, plus, that would be like um, 180? 180 million plus, um, what did I say, 49 million? Right. That's our, yeah, so uh, I'm getting 49 million. million total cases. Plus what of vaccination? 180? So it's not quite, yeah, it's still in the 300. It's not 330 million. It's two something. Okay. Let's let's add it up. Uh, let's do uh, forty nine million plus. What did you say, Brian? One hundred eighty million va yeah, from uh, vaccinations. That's two hundred twenty nine. So you still have a hundred million people who are uninfected and unvaccinated, and that's why. Amazing. I mean, you, you can still have thousands and thousands of people infected, right? Sure. So the last sentence, the last paragraph: A choice not to get vaccinated is not risk free. Um, that, that's what Brianne pointed out. It's a choice to take a different and more serious risk. And then they say the biomedical community must strive to make this clear to the public. It could be one of the most important health decisions a parent will make. And so I took that as a call. So we're part of the biomedical community, right? You bet. Mm -hmm. you bet. Well, three of us here and all of the other podcasters and all the other scientists we know. That's right. So I was reading this yesterday. And I, and I sent off an email to Paul Offit and I said, okay, let's help amplify your message. Come back on TWIV and say this. So <laughs> it's coming back on the 17th of December. Ah, terrific. Because oh. this is not something you could say too many times, right? I guess not. No, and because, his last uh, episode was so good. That's really exciting. I would agree. Yeah, I want to hear his, his him talk about children and vaccination. And I also want to hear him talk about boosters um, yeah. to see where he stands because that's right. two months ago, I wrote a blog post saying, here are the reasons why I don't think a booster is needed. And he wrote me and he said, I totally agree with you. <laughs> I want to see if he's changed, which is fine. And if so, what are the data? Right. Okay. So that is an editorial. Now we move to um, a preprint, which I'm trying to steer away from preprints, but I thought this one, you know, it, it could be used some fixing, but we can sort it out. This one, it's on MedArchive. Increased risk of infection with SARS-CoV-2 beta, gamma, and delta variant compared to alpha variant in vaccinated individuals. So it's a very specific comparison. And this comes out of um, the um, Center for Infectious Disease Control at, in the Netherlands. And the first author is um, Stin and so Do I think we, we have some co? We, yeah. yeah, we have co-first authors and co-final authors. So Stin and and Harry Venema are mm -hmm. the co-first authors. And Miriam Knoll and Dirk Egink are the co-last right. authors. Okay. And this is the sort of study that um, I've been waiting to see. Um, you know, we have vaccinated quite a few people. Um, and now the question, and they were all, all, mostly, vac they're all vaccinated using a vaccine based on the ancestral SARS-CoV-2 virus, right? And now we have had a series of variants, as you heard in the title. And the question is, how well does vaccination uh, protect against infection? And so here they uh, they look at the so the alpha variant was first detected in September 2020, 
the beta in May of 2020, the gamma in November of 2020, and delta in October of 2020. They all have amino acid changes in the uh, receptor binding domain and the N-terminal domain of the spike protein, and these are places where the neutralizing antibodies are binding. And we've talked about studies that have shown that both uh, convalescent sera and some monoclonals uh, have, have a harder time neutralizing these. Um, so uh, alpha variant seems to be neutralized quite well with convalescent sera. Um, the beta has a greater loss of neutralization activity and a little bit less of a loss for gamma and delta. But remember, you're still protected in the 90s against hospitalization and death. Exactly right. Exactly it's very important right. to remember. And so they say, you know, there's some suggestion that vaccine effectiveness, so that is real world effectiveness of vaccination preventing disease as opposed to efficacy, which is what you measure in the clinical trial. Uh, it seems to be a bit lower for beta, gamma, and delta. Um, so um, both for vaccination and for infection. So if you inf get infected and recover, that's very interesting, right? What's, what, how well are you protected against all of these variants? And so that's what they have uh, done here. In the Netherlands, they have quite an, an amazing vaccine program. Uh, they have mRNA vaccines, two mRNA vaccines. They have uh, two adeno-based vaccines. And they say as of July 2021, everyone 12 years and up has been offered vaccination. As of November, 84% of all adults are fully vaccinated. Boy, is that a great number. That's yep. fantastic. <laughs> Compared to 69% of you. That was 59%. 59%, yeah. And 88% have gotten one dose. Most often used is the, are the mRNA vaccines. That's 76% of all doses. Um, at the Pfizer, that is. And the less, less used is uh, the Moderna vaccine and uh, the adeno-vectored vaccine. Um, uh, they show, they say here, vaccination has proven to be highly effective, especially against hospitalization and death. And get this, it reduces the secondary attack rate within households. What does right. that mean? Right. Well, a household is a really good place to study transmission because you know who's there, right? <laughs> yeah. My whole family has been home for the past three months. We got this and that. Yeah, and so then that, that's you a key can say, piece of info to say that these vaccines are actually blocking transmission, which is a big yeah. part of that herd immunity uh, Yes, that's idea. right. Exactly. So that's, that's key. The vaccines are reducing transmission as, as shown in household uh, attack rates. And so for people to say they're not helping, they're not impeding transition, transmission is simply wrong, right? Okay, so um, in this study, they uh, – right, so a little more background information. In the Netherlands, you know, people test positive. Uh, they take a random sampling of the positive, and they sequence them to see what variant is circulating. And so they know when the alpha began. They say the alpha circulated uh, beginning in January, but in June it was displaced by the delta. And from August onwards, it's causing all the infections in the Netherlands. So what they did is, in this study, they want to know, does vaccination, which, as I said, is using an ancestral virus, ancestral spike, how does it protect against these variants? And how does it compare with people who get infected and recover who have not been vaccinated? Okay, we're all good there? Yep. yep. It's all the data that we've been wanting to see for a long time. Exactly. So they have a lot of cases. This goes from March to August of this year. 661,000 plus case, positive cases were part of this national database. 38,000, 5.8% were partly vaccinated. 3.9% were fully vaccinated. That's 25,000. And 10,000, one. 0.6% had a known previous infection. So those are people who 
or infected, and then they're seeing if they get reinfected. Right. And and note that if you look at that math, that comes out to about 10% of people, which means that 90% of infections were in naive individuals. That's right. Uh, and then they say most of these, uh, of the partly vaccinated case, most received community, uh, followed by Vaxevria, Janssen, and Spike Vax. All right. So um, this, they take these data and they do statistical procedures to interpret them. Okay. And that's, you know, you don't just get the raw data. You do, you have to do associations and they, they, they calculate odds ratios, right? Which means like, what's the odds? And in fact, it's a ratio, right? The odds that someone who's vaccinated uh, is going to get infected versus someone who's not vaccinated, the ratio of the two, right? And that's called an odds. What's the odds you're getting infected? And they're doing it as a ratio comparing the, in this case, the vaccinated versus uh, uh, other population. It depends what population we're talking about. So that's that's one way to do it. So for example, full vaccination was associated with infection with beta, gamma, or delta compared to alpha. So yeah, you're, you're going to get infected with those, but the odds ratio is for beta, it's 3.1. For gamma, it's 2.3. And for delta, it's 1.9. So you're 1.9 times more likely to get uh, infected with um, delta after full vaccination compared with alpha, right? A little yeah. higher risk of getting infected with delta. Is that, did, I, did I interpret that correctly? Is that right? Yeah. Yes, you interpreted that correctly. So uh, basically it is 3.1 times as much beta, 2.3 times as much gamma, 1.9 times as much delta all compared to alpha. Right. However, no significant association between previous infection and beta, gamma, or delta over alpha. Odds ratio is 1.4.31 with big confidence intervals. So that's why they say, so basically if you were infected and recovered, you're equally protected among, against all the variants, right? Mm -hmm. Alpha, beta, gamma, or delta, which is interesting. And this is a good powered study. A lot of people. Yeah. Um, that that so, might say that there's something about immune responses to something other than spike. Yeah, right. <laughs> Not sh it's shocking to think such a thing, right? I, I know, the, um, the idea that there might be epitopes in, in nucleocapsid or nucleocapsid protein. You know, other, or, yeah, yeah, other proteins that are protective. Now, this is, they're, they're reporting all COVID, right? All PCR positive COVID in this. It's not stratified in any way. And if they had, they might have found some other differences, right? But um, yeah, other proteins are likely to make a difference for sure. Now, Brian, does this mean that you sh people should go out and get infected and not get vaccinated? Mm, no. Although my answer to that is very much related to some data we've seen in other papers about things like differences in um, overall levels of antibody responses or longevity or uh, things like that. And so in general, it seems like those who are vaccinated have a less variable and higher uh, on the high end uh, level of antibodies, while those who are uh, infected have a very variable level of response um, and also may have some um, issues with that immune response because of the virus modifying um immune cells and trying to block the immune response. Right. I also think that being infected carries with it a risk, right? Exactly. Of getting yes. very sick. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, Just like we talked about for kids, it's the same for adults, right? Right. Sure. In, in fact, I my students are uh, doing some homework about a paper right now, and um, it shows all of these great things that can happen to you um, in a particular infection scenario if you live. Um and yeah. vaccines don't have that additional caveat of you have to live through it first. Yes, that's right. D Daniel said the other night, he was he talked about this briefly in his, his clinical update, that people are using this preprint 
to say, hey, I'm vaccinated. I don't, I'm, I'm infected and recovered. I don't need to be vaccinated. But um, I don't think that's what the data say, right? No. And if you remember the uh, paper from Paul Binash and Theodora Hatzianu that showed mm-hmm. the levels of immune responses after infection and then vaccination, that hybrid immunity, those were just amazing sort of superhero sure. levels of immune responses. Yeah. Yeah, so I would say if you recovered, you ought to get a, a dose of a vaccine because then, then you get this really tremendous immunity, which uh, is better than that of most others. So, and remember, these are odds ratios. The the likelihood of you getting infected is, you know, compared to one variant compared to another. It doesn't say anything about severe disease, and as we know from other studies, it's the T cells that are prevent preventing severe disease and hospitalization. Right. So this doesn't reflect that at all, right? This, I would say, is overwhelmingly biased to just infecting and not necessarily severe disease, which is not surprising because just being infected, if there's a mismatch between the, the virus and the, the vaccine, you're going to get infected, right? Yeah, I, I think this paper is interesting in helping me think about the different viruses and the different variants. Yes. Um, but does not necessarily give me kind of big picture immunology um, take home messages. Um, they compared different vaccine types. And when you do that, the association between full vaccination and infection that we've just discussed for Delta was significant for Community and Janssen, but not for Spike Vax and Vaxevria. That's interesting, right? So you're getting different responses, I suppose. They also stratified the data by time since vaccination. So between 14 and 59 days, uh, the odds ratio was higher of getting infected with one of the variants compared to 60 days or more. So that shouldn't surprise us, surprise us right, Brianne, because it's more time to mature the response. Exactly. That shouldn't surprise us at all. It tells us that, yes, in fact, B cells do need to go through a germinal center response that takes them a little while um, before they make their best possible antibodies. All right. So overall, the summary is, folks, increased risk of infection by beta, gamma, delta compared to alpha after full vaccination, less so if you go beyond 59 days, regardless of vaccine overall, uh, but not um, if you are infected and recovered, no, no difference in uh, being infected by any of these variants if you've recovered from infection. Um, and they say, this is an important point of note, these analyses do not aim to determine the probability of getting infected after vaccination or infection, but rather the likelihood of getting infected with specific variants of concern. Right? So that's a big difference in those two things. Um, the, um, and, and they also point out current literature still shows high vaccine effectiveness of 90 to 95% against severe COVID for Delta, which is reassuring. They point out, yes, we have been saying that for some time. It's reassuring. This is true. Uh, and they know, they also point this out. No, with very high vaccine effectiveness. A difference of a factor of 1.5 to 2 between two variants could go unnoticed, as it would only mean a decrease of effectiveness of 95 to 92%. So I guess the the 1.5 to 2 are the odds ratios they're talking about, right? Right. Um, So that's not a big difference in terms of vaccine effectiveness. Right. And, you know, again, I think your point here is very important that it's vaccine effectiveness against uh, infection here. And they're not thinking about symptomatic infection or hospitalization, um, in which case you probably would have even more protection. And they do um, point out that for alpha and beta and other studies, Reduction was not observed for T-cell immunity. I'm glad they put it in there <laughs> instead of ignoring it entirely, right? Exactly. Thank you. Um, so the this, um, also, they say, given the broad and sometimes overlapping confidence intervals, the differences need to be interpreted with caution. That's the part that's left out when this is covered in the press, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. This could be not quite right, right? It could be that the 
these these error bars are so big that maybe they're not very different after all. So they finally say uh, it is not yet clear whether previous infection or vaccination induces better protection against infection. However, and and they say that despite their numbers, right? Because it's still not clear. And I, you, you could probably find another study which may have the opposite findings. However, primary infection comes with a risk of hospitalization or death, especially in older persons with underlying conditions. And so vaccination is preferred over infection to prevent to protect against severe disease. So there it is. That's a good way to end this, right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Get vaccinated. I feel like that at this point, that's the take-home message from both of the papers we've talked about is the take-home message is uh, getting yes. infected has <laughs> risk. Getting vaccinated is uh, does not have that risk. You should get vaccinated. Right. All right. And now we have an actual peer-reviewed and published paper. This is also in science. And did you notice, folks, that the author list is like 10 pages? Mm-hmm. Really? It's at the end because the first page has wow. got a lot of authors, but then they say the uh, immune assay team, Moderna, the coronavirus vaccine prevention network, the coronavirus efficacy team, and the U.S. government biostatistics team. Good heavens. And there are pages and pages. I was going through and I'm going, is this duplicated? No, it's, no, it's <laughs> not. Oh, my gosh. So, Vincent, a, a little minor note here. If you're writing a paper and you want to cite this and you're using the Chicago style of references, mm -hmm. you have to find the first names of each one of those authors. Really? And you have to put that secondary to their last name. Wow. And a lot of journals don't publish the full last, the full first names of these authors. Uh -huh. I mean, sometimes science does. I think science they, actually they does. They do. But, it, uh, imagine in the list at the end, they do have the first names. They have everyone's Imagine name, yeah. typing this thing out though, and trying to keep track of everybody's first name as you put their names down for this. Can't you just go Jones et al? <laughs> Some citation <laughs> methods allow mm -hmm. that. Yeah, I know, but Chicago does not allow that. Uh -huh. I can tell you that's. No one will write an article in which the Chicago style of of, of uh, manuscripts uh, will be enforced. These poor people, and and also another point: when your name is among those three pages of uh, authors, how do you take that to your chairman and say, "Look, I, I've got a great paper here, and I've, <laughs> I deserve to be considered for tenure." <laughs> well, I, I don't. I think it's. These are teams. This is probably not going to happen at that this level. This is unique right. to the pandemic. We have all these teams working on these things, and they just— yeah, That's true, but I, I'm, I'm often thought of um, the physics literature. Yeah, they do have big author lists. Where you've got, you know, like two sentences worth of findings and three pages worth of authors. Yeah. No, and I often so, see uh, those long yeah, I do too. Uh, author lists so. in physics papers. I know. I'm, Correct. I mean, I'm not sure it does you any good in terms of your your— career, but it certainly says you made a contribution, so that's fine. Yeah, that's right. No that's question okay. about it. Anyway, this is called Immune Correlates Analysis of the mRNA-1273 COVID-19 Vaccine Efficacy Clinical Trial. So these are now, this is a publication based on the phase three, which was done some time ago, as you know, but it takes this long for it to be analyzed and um, published, peer-reviewed, and so forth. And you know the the licensure was long a long process. Um, yes, but now we're we're trying to see is there some trend in the numbers that can help us understand what levels of antibodies would if if in fact antibodies and if so what levels of antibodies would protect you uh, from infection, and so that's the basis. And I must say I had some difficulty with a lot of this because. It is all statistical data. I mean, it's got neutralization assays and binding assays for antibodies, which is fine. But the analysis is statistics, and um, the, I find I found the writing to be uh, not terribly accessible in parts. I don't know what you guys felt, but um, uh, had some trouble was, with this. I thought it was okay, but I certainly had to take my time and pay close attention. <laughs> so, um, I mean, the main point here is they say, look. And we've said this before about correlates of protection. We'd like to know 
what protects you so that we can license new vaccines because we're not going to be able to do these same kinds of clinical trials. You can't have a placebo controlled anymore because now we have vaccines that work. So you ethically cannot withhold that in a clinical trial. So you're going to have to inoculate people and measure whatever it is that's the correlate, if it's antibodies, and then say, okay, this vaccine exceeded it and, and now we could license it. And so they say, you know, we're going to need new vaccines for a while because we just still don't have enough to take care of the world. Absolutely. So the COVE phase three trial, coronavirus efficacy, that's the phase three. It's called efficacy, not effectiveness. Um, it, it's continuing, right? It's uh, even though the vaccine is, has received an EUA, this is the Moderna vaccine, uh, the analysis of the data continues for several years. And this is part of that. Um, and, and I remind you, this showed 94% efficacy against all COVID in that first analysis. And that's why it gave an, it got an EUA. And it's currently being evaluated for uh, licensure. Um, so this paper looks at those data and says, can we get some clue about what's important for protection? And they only look at antibodies. They don't look at T cells. Um, they look at... Uh, antibodies binding to the whole spike, to the receptor binding domain. They do 50% inhibitory uh, antibody titers. Uh, and they say each of these correlate with, have previously shown to be correlated with protection in macaques, protection against infection. So they say, what about people? Um, what, what can we say about this? So they have, um, it's a subset of the the original trial, the original 40,000 people, 1,000 vaccine recipients, 137 placebo. Because remember, we're doing uh, a lot of neutralization and binding assays on these samples. So these are samples that you still have from that, from that study. 34%, 65 or over, 40% at risk for severe COVID, right? They have other comorbidities. So that's good. That's good numbers that you'd like to have these extreme groups represented for this. They also have good racial and ethnic diversity as well. Um, so they have two um, day antibody markers, day 29 and day 57. Um, day seven days post day 29 and post 57, and they divide the people into those groups. And I point out, as I said, this study is going to follow people for two years. And they say, why are we doing that? Well, we'd like to have future uh, analysis of how the levels of antibodies correlate with risk, right? Because the levels are contracting. Yes. And so we'd like to know as they contract, what is your risk? Does it change? Right. And this also kind of lets us have an idea of the general kinetics of the response. Just what is the shape of the response over time? How long does it persist? So at day 57, almost 100% of the recipients had positive uh, detectable response, antibody responses by all of these four things, uh, spike, re receptor binding domain, 50%, ID50, et cetera. Okay. Which is very nice. Everybody response, responded. Um, and as the risk, as the... Uh, antibody at the, as these titers uh, increase, the risk for infection decreases. And they're looking at all COVID; they're not they're not stratifying it. the The COVID risk decreases as the antibody levels rise, and they have some nice graphs that show this. And they say uh, it's a smooth curve; it's not stepped which suggests that there's a continuum of, of susceptibility and not some threshold that you have to go above uh, to change the, the risk. Uh, and they can also look at specific titers, right? And this is pretty cool. So we're looking at in the amount of antibody that will neutralize 50% of the virus that you put into the assay. So they're doing an infectivity assay with virus. And so on day 57, they have... 10, 100, and 1,000 uh, antibody levels, ID50s. Actually, they call them international unit 50. And at 10, 
the vaccine efficacy is 78%. Again, at 100, it's 91%. And at 1,000, it's 96%. So increased neutralization activity, you have increased protection against COVID. So that is the, the, from 10 to 1,000, it's a 5.5-fold increase in vaccine risk reduction. So redu risk of disease reduced by vaccination. They also, they, they see the same at day 29, but the numbers are just lower because there's less of a maturation of the antibody response. Um, I, and I think that, one thing that they also point out here is that they say, in contrast, um, estimated vaccine efficacy appeared to vary only minimally with each binding antibody marker. And so it looks like they were able to stratify here um, based on neutralizing antibodies and say, That's we right. can say that there are these different types of, um, we can say this level of neutralizing antibody is associated with protection or not, but they couldn't do that with binding antibodies. And I think that that's really important for people to understand because there are some people who really think that they want to be able to get their antibodies tested to know if they are protected or not. Um, and right. the, when if you were to do that, um, you would be getting binding antibodies tested, which in this paper, they don't have a relationship between binding antibodies and um, protection. And so if you think that you are getting some important information from those antibody tests, we don't really mm -hmm. know what level is needed for protection. This paper is cool because it tells us what level of neutralizing antibodies are sort of related to protection. Um, so maybe if you knew how many neutralizing antibodies you had, that could be helpful, but that's not something that is measured routinely um, clinically. And so that's not what you're getting at your doctor's office. They actually say that the type of right. measurement you get at your doctor's office was not uh, something that they could get a correlation on here. And this, these conclusions that these three antibody levels give you this kind of protection, they validate these with some other statistical approaches and they get the same answer. And then they ask, how can we know uh, how effective the vaccine is uh, for people who don't, who either have low levels or or none, haven't responded? It's hard to do that because they say fewer than 2% of the recipients had negative or undetectable antibodies, right? So the number is too small. So they have some statistical ways of going about that. And in the end, they conclude that um, – 68% is a lower bound for the proportion of vaccine efficacy that is mediated uh, at, through the 50% in, inhibitory dose at day 29 and day 57. So 68%, the lower bound for how much efficacy is mediated uh, through this infectious dose, 50%. So that um, would mean that, they, say, the or 30 something percent might be mediated by T cells or NK cells or something else. That's right. So how much is mediated by antibody versus something else? So that just two thirds of the efficacy seems to be mediated by uh, neutralizing antibody. And they say, okay, for influenza, we have a lot of data that we can compare. So for influenza, the hemagglutination inhibition titer is used as a correlate of protection. Um, this guides vaccine strain selection every year, the hemagglutination inhibition titer of serum that they collect. So they say the HI titer against the AB um, influenza virus, which is in the vaccine, mediated an estimated 57% of vaccine efficacy against confirmed influenza. So it's kind of in the same ballpark, right? 58, 57, 68%. So they're using this to say we've made some statistical approximations, but it agrees with at least one other virus and so could be right. right? And, and so they're kind of, you know, coming to the argument of people who say, oh, well, we shouldn't just care about whether or not the vaccine induces antibodies. We need to measure more. And here they're saying, no, measuring antibodies is going to be enough um, it's giving us as much predictive ability as it is with other viruses 
for which we also measure antibodies. Right. And, and another point is that the um, acute care for early uh, infection involves the use of a monoclonal antibody, which uh, reduces your chances of dying quite a bit uh, for the first week of the infection, as I recall. So you have every right to expect that antibodies are good measures of protection, even from that uh, yeah, for sure. kind of an intervention strategy also. But, I mean, it raises the question, though, and we've talked about this a lot, but your your vex, your antibody levels do not remain at, at such high no, levels. No, they don't. For long periods, they contract, which is you the normal process. Up. So you can't <laughs> expect to, to maintain them that long. You can't expect to be protected against infection. But what you want is to be protected against hospitalization and death. And right. that is the part of this that is not caused by antibodies, most likely. It's caused by T cells, right? Right. right. So is there an uh, anamnestic response in people that have been vaccinated just twice without a booster? If they become infected, does their antibody levels go up quicker than uh, ordinary as a result of exposure to the antigens to begin with? Um, I don't know the data, but the theory is absolutely. I mean, that's sort of the, yeah. the basic yeah. immunology of yeah. how that works. So, yeah, exactly right. That's why I was suggesting that. So you would expect that even if you've been vaccinated and the antibody levels waned, re-exposure or exposure to the live infection or the infectious agent is enough to, in a very short time, boost your antibody levels back up to a protected right. level. Right. And so that's, yeah. you know, that's because of the memory B cells that you have induced. And yeah, so, exactly. yeah, there's, yeah, there's exactly. been this yeah. idea of, well, maybe we need to be measuring memory B cells here. Um, but I think that this paper is right. really important because it says, no, if you are a vaccine developer and you're trying to make a different vaccine, um, you don't have to do all of that sophisticated immunology work. It looks like this particular measurement at day 57 is going to give you um, a, re yeah. a, a comparable and a good idea of protection. Um, and so even though we do certainly want to know how those antibodies wane and we do, you know, I as an immunologist can sure. come up with about a thousand things that I would love to see Different reasons, <laughs> um, <that's right>. in <laughs> terms of these parameters. <laughs> it's important to, to know that this is the thing you should be looking for if you are trying to develop another vaccine. Sure. But, but Brianne, if, if um, you can't assume that getting this level of antibody is also going to give you T cell immunity, right? Exactly. That's very true. So, and so that's I'm why that 68% is important. They're saying that basically this is explaining 68% of the response. Those T cells, we, we are not accounting for here, um, but yeah. it looks like if you get this level of antibody, it is associated with a certain amount of protection. And it's protection against infection. It doesn't get into the severe part. You're correct. Right. And they, they say additional immune markers are likely needed to fully explain the observed vaccine efficacy in this COVE trial. For example, FC functions of antibodies, T cells, mucosal antibodies, which they don't measure here, memory responses. So... <sighs> I think it's a little misleading to say we if you achieve this, we'll license your vaccine without specifically looking at protection yeah, against that's, severe that's, disease, that's, right? That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Because couldn't couldn't it be possible that you see an overall um, reduction in any COVID, but the severe component can vary without you having an effect on the overall component? Sure, absolutely. Right? I think that Everything you're saying here is correct, but let's imagine we are in some time in the future where we don't have a lot of active uh, SARS-CoV-2 cases against which mm -hmm. to test the vaccine. Um, and we need to test a new vaccine at some point. And you can imagine this sure, same kind sure. of thing with other emerging viruses. Um, if Yes, that is the ideal, is to be able to test and look at protection from disease. But if yeah, you don't yeah, okay. have a it's lot good. of circulation, you need some alternative measure. And so this does give an idea of what an alternative measure could be. Okay, so sure. that's very that's a great point. And it could be that you have this new vaccine, you get these 
correlates and you license it, but it doesn't protect well against severe disease, right? right exactly. Oh. That's especially all- as especially as antibody levels contract, because when when antibody levels are high, you can prevent infection or severely reduce it. But if once you have a contraction, you are more dependent on T cell responses to give you protection against severe disease. And you may not see that in your in your vaccine. Right. And yeah. so based on the data they have here, they know that if your vaccine gives you this level of antibodies, you would have approximately this level of protection against infection. Right. It's not coincidental. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's a it's a bit of a nuance, right? It but it's it's, it's, yeah. it's important to remember because yeah. people look at this and say, "Oh, this is all I need." But it's not. Exactly. And they in fact say you know, another interpretation is these other things could be important uh, as well. So um, they also compare their modeling with other results. So there have been some attempts to calculate correlates of protection for the uh, uh, Chadox uh, adenovirus vectored vaccine. Um, and they say... Um, for the AZD vaccine, vaccine efficacy was 70% and 90% at spike IgG levels of 113 and 899, which they say compares roughly with theirs. So they're saying, you know, this, this looks okay, compares with other vaccines in terms of what we're th- figuring out to be our uh, correlate here. And they also say uh, these can be compared with pseudovirus neutralization results. They also do some, instead of a, in addition to infectious virus, SARS-CoV-2, they do a pseudovirus and say, we get the same results, basically. So you could use a pseudovirus, right? Um, And then they also refer to some correlates uh, in uh, mRNA vaccine vaccinated macaques they say all macaques with a spike IgG greater than 336 at four weeks, weeks, four weeks post-second dose were protected from having over 10,000 subgenomic mRNA copies per mil in the bronchioalveolar lavage. And in their study, day 57 spike IgG 336, which is what they found in the, in the non-human macaques, non-human primates, correlates with 90% efficiency. So again, they're saying that t- the two different systems are giving similar findings. So what they conclude is that here we've contributed some evidence towards a correlate. We haven't established it. We need to do more. This is not establish a correlate. We're, we're making right. some. We're <clears throat> making some progress. Um, neutralization titer is a potential surrogate marker for vaccination of COVID that can be considered a primary endpoint for basing certain provisional approval decisions, right? Provisional. Yes. Because then you'd have to put it in people and see how it does, you know, as we said, with severe disease, right? Mm -hmm. Are there any of these vaccine developers and routes of administration which uh, would favor T-cell stimulation versus antibody stimulation? I mean, do we have a difference in route of... Uh, administration or uh, the type of, let's say, a virus vectored uh, vaccine, which involves just a protein or something of this sort versus the mRNA that, that, that was used here. Did we get a, these are the companies that had their stake in the antibody field. Is that so- correct? The general idea is that a purified protein is going to predominantly induce an antibody response and the nucleic acid, um, be it mRNA or DNA, be it delivered by lipid or be it delivered by a viral vector is going to give you both antibodies Uh, and T cells. Um, Now, do you know of any vaccines that would just favor T cells versus antibody. I, I don't know of any vaccines that would favor T cells okay, instead of antibody. So, so you can't eliminate the component of antibody production as a, a potential correlate of protection. No, and, and antibodies are going to be very important because they are protecting um, you against having 
a cell free virus, virus that has not yet gotten into cells. T cells can only yeah, yeah, do yeah, something right. about that's right. that's cell associated right. virus. That's right. um, so antibodies are that's, always going to be useful. It's just whether you also have that add on of T cells or not. Right. Yeah, of course. If you, that's why you could get a mild infection with lower antibody levels, right? right? Exactly. But, sure. Mild sure, symptoms, sure. but the T cells will help protect you. My, Brianne, if you could take, let's say, you take nuclear protein, where we have no evidence that antibodies will neutralize infection, although they could, but nobody's looked at it. But let's assume not. Then you would get only T cell. So if you just gave a nuclear protein vaccine, then uh-huh. maybe a T-cell specific vaccine, maybe, right? Maybe. I seem to remember some of the data looking at antibody responses across the virus from very early in the pandemic that did have some antibody epitopes in nuclear protein. Um, so I can't say that for certain. Um, but yes, if you if you had a protein with no antibody epitopes, then it would be just a T-cell based vaccine. I mean, no, no epitopes that gave rise to neutralizing sure, antibodies, exactly. right? Yes. Yeah, right. Whereas, right, but right, the non-neutralizing right. could still make a difference, yeah, obviously, yeah, exactly. right? Sure, sure, sure. So they they do make the point saying this is all done when we didn't have these variants circulating. So we should probably look at that, which would entail, you know, saying. Do, do these same levels protect you against Delta or do you need some other antibody levels, right? Which was part yeah, of the yeah. point of the preprint we talked about, you know, which suggests exactly. that some of the variants are um, you're more likely to get infected with them compared to the virus that you were immunized with. But um, that's something that they don't have here. And, the, you know, often the limitations I don't really um, mention, but I think this – for this paper, the limitations are actually quite good, or I, I should say interesting. Limitations include inability to control for exposure factors, i.e., e.g., how much virus you get, right? That could make a difference. We have no idea the range of inocula that people get. Um, the other is we could be evaluating statistical correlates of protection, but not mechanistic correlates. <laughs> what actually protects you? Because, and, and we talked about that before with some other, when we did that review mm-hmm. article by uh, mm-hmm. Florian Kramer, he did the same thing. We have statistical correlates and then we have mechanistic, which is the neutralization, right? The prevention right. of infection. Well, or sort of the other idea and is that perhaps in people who have this level of antibodies, they also happen mm-hmm. to have a high level of T cells, and the T cells are actually doing this exactly. at the antibody level as something that you're yes. able to measure. Thank you. That that puts it properly. I didn't really explain it right. That's right. Um, so you're you're fooled by the statistics, right? And um, they only looked at COVID. They didn't say severe COVID, asymptomatic COVID, etc. Right. So that may make a difference as well. And then one of their other um, limitations is the inability to assess the effects of boosting, which I would, I think it would be interesting, right, to see, do you simply get the same numbers? In other words, 10, 100, 1,000 and correlate with it, or do you get at 10 a bigger effect than you saw at 10 without a boost because you're getting a broader repertoire, right? Induced by the boost. That would be interesting. Yeah, I think that would be really interesting. I remember when Shane Crotty was here, he said that there was you know, a, a qualitative difference um, in the immune response you get the third time with something. Um, and that, yeah. that's really stuck with me. And so I'd love to see if that plays out here. Huh. Well, you may get your chance uh, <laughs> because there are lots more variants on their way, it appears. <laughs> yes. And- well, there is a, a new one that's, a, that's a, caused the stock market to crash today. The Omicron, <laughs> Omicron version, right? B1.1.529, is that it? Yeah, well, and, and so, yes, uh, yesterday. You're old school, Vincent. You're old yesterday school. Yesterday, <laughs> it was being uh, potentially discussed as new, but now apparently they're skipping new and going to Omicron. Right. We'll talk about there are that. Not that many Greek letters left, actually. <laughs> we'll talk you about have to have the a sub chi and a sub phi and a sub. <laughs> we'll talk about that variant next week, but 
I want to point out, you guys remember when Theodora and Paul were last year, they talked about their polymutant? Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where they took yeah, yeah, all yeah. the spike changes that, where they identified using all their monoclonals, yep. right. getting resistant, and they put them all in one virus. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> that was quite resistant, but not zero. It was still neutralized by convalescent zero, which is, I think that's sort of the equivalent of this virus, this new variant. Yeah. yeah, yeah that yeah, was what yeah, it yeah. sounded um, like so. uh, when I was reading about it yesterday. But any, I don't know, Brienne, do you remember from their discussion whether it was as fit as the parental virus or did it have some fitness costs? I do not remember. I'd have to go back and look at that paper. Yeah, I don't call. But anyway, we'll look it up and talk about it on Tuesday because if it's less fit, then pssst, it's going to yeah. fizzle out probably. Yeah. And I also like that they do mention sort of that they have not uh, measured in this paper um, some of the other types of responses. But at the same time, as mm -hmm. I look at the list of authors, um, you know, the cast of thousands, uh, there are quite a few people who are uh, well qualified to do those. And so that could be a follow up here. I'm sure. I'm sure we'll continue to see these data for a long time. I can also imagine an experiment using the macaques to go back. This is naive macaques now. Yeah. Where you take a given amount of antibody and you give it to all the macaques. And then over time, you measure the, the decay rate of the antibody. And at regular intervals, you expose the macaques to the infection to see if you can correlate how much antibody is really necessary in order to prevent the virus from succeeding. So, so no one has ever done that. I know because it's, it's too expensive. Yeah, and I think that the way you, the way you actually do that, Dixon, is that you um, immunize the macaques and measure their antibody levels over time and then do the correlation yeah, yeah. instead of delivering antibody Yeah, but they give a, each, each macaque is different, right? If you do it that way. It Whereas is, if you they give are. It everybody the same amount of antibody, at least they all start out identical. Yeah, but that assumes that the same amount of antibody gets in and persists in all of them. Well, well, you'd be measuring it. That's the point. I think the, the immunization is okay, Dixon, because you can. I didn't say that. It wasn't. But, but, the, but, the, but the, <laughs> the experiment that we mentioned in macaques, they just immunized and I know. measured yeah, and right. then challenged. That's right. And, that's right. But, but looking at different times would be interesting. Um, but yeah, it seems to me you'd need a lot of animals, you, and they often don't use a lot because they're very expensive. Well, you right? need a lot of animals because usually when you do those studies, um, yeah. you want to actually look at immune responses throughout the body, and so you will euthanize at different time points. And so you, yeah. you're not yeah, going to necessarily follow right. the, right. the same animal for long periods of time. You tend to want right. to be able to look in tissues. So um, – We've we've just talked about an hour on you know three antibody, two antibody studies, and I just want to point out that if you watch the evening news and hear ten seconds, you're not going to get the right impression. <laughs> it's not easy, and I know you may not have time to listen to every twiv and all of it, but you can't get conclusions from what you hear on the nightly news. It, it's not the whole yeah, story. I'm yeah. sorry. It's not even an executive summary in most cases. And the, the, this latest variant blowing up the news is just crazy. It's well, just crazy. Why is it happening, Dixon? Because there's a lull in the action, so to speak. I mean, there's a, you know, it looks like everybody's getting vaccinated, or at least a lot of people are. The disease is going down. Um, if you want to cry wolf, here's another wolf. Dixon, can you move your boom up a little? I can. I'm sorry. I should have said this an hour ago, but no, nah, that's okay. That's now, okay. when you so talk, have, that, is that better? It was beautiful. It's just beautiful. Oh, good. Good. Since I had, so I, I think. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I just think that newsworthy um, data are are scant. I mean, this is not a sensationalistic epidemic. Basically, it's a long term drag them out, knock down, sock them up, and people are just so sick and tired of hearing about this that they don't know what to do next. Except, oh. Wait, here's a new variant. We can talk about that. Yes, but you know what part of the issue is, Dixon? Many people get really affected uh, psychologically by this new news, right? They think, yeah, I do oh, know that. I do I'm know doomed. That. I can't, 
That's right. We, we can never beat this, which isn't true. And that's right. That really affects a lot of people, and I think that's unfortunate, right? Yeah, I know, but but look what they're looking at. They're probably a lot of them are parents, and they see their kids go out to school, and then all of a sudden they were told that their kids can't go to school anymore because the rate of infection is going up again. So you know they're they're yo-yoing between elation that it's over and depression that it's still here, and it's true for both of those situations. It's <laughs> you know even if you're all doing the right thing, it could still infect you. It may not kill you but it's certainly going to infect you so yeah i have to say uh, this certainly makes most of the flu pandemics with the exception of 1918 look like nothing right it's never happened exactly exactly and the other thing this reminds me of the stock market once you mentioned that the stock market goes up and down on a whim uh when eisenhower was uh president and I was just a kid, uh, he suffered multiple heart attacks. Mm. And every heart attack was visited by Wall Street going down. Yeah, He would recover, Wall Street would go back up. Then he had another heart attack, and Wall Street went down. Then he had recovered. Oh, it goes back up again. So what was all that about? I mean, um, <clears throat> it's hard to know what actually causes the Wall Street people to fluctuate and and people to sell stock or buy stock. That's the other thing, of course. It's probably a, a different correlate than antibodies protecting against COVID-19. Well, isn't it the fact that if certain people think the market's going to go down, they sell and then it goes down and then they buy again. And then it's, That's they right. Make no, no, that, listen, if, if you could control that. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. I think we're onto something here. Uh, <laughs> you wouldn't need any of these contributions to the um, 501c3 uh, organization. We could make the money on the stock market, but uh, no, I don't no, suggest doing uh, that for I would, a minute. I would be very bad at that. I would, oh, I would lose my, all my money in the first day. Yeah, that's, not, that's not my <laughs> job. And that's not my expertise, but it seems to me uh, to, no, I hear to, you. to base a big part of your economy on this kind of fickle thing is crazy, no? Yeah. It is. But what do I know? I agree. I just know about viruses. Uh, you know a lot about viruses. And all I know right now is get vaccinated. God, it will solve your problems. Right. It will solve you. And if you are vaccinated fully, and you shouldn't worry about any variant that comes you along, get, you'll be good. Get vaccinated. Tell your friends to get vaccinated. Tell your family to get vaccinated. For sure. And then get vaccinated. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Okay, let's do some picks, Dixon. Right. What do you have for us? Well, this is my last comedian pick, <laughs> um, and I picked a controversial comedian, but um, his uh, stage name is Pee Wee Herman, but his uh, real name is Paul Rubens. Uh, and Pee Wee Herman, in the beginning of his career, was the most charming, the most inventive, the most um, looked at and viewed by children uh, in his Pee Wee's Playhouse uh, and one of these episodes is listed in the footnotes. Um, he's a charming individual with serious character flaws. <laughs> and he was arrested many times and he did some jail time. And I don't even know why he was in jail. I haven't looked that up. And I hope that it wasn't for something that I'll regret picking him for. But I know he was released afterwards. And he went on a number of talk shows then and um, explained his past basically to the audience. And uh, he has a knack for becoming a child and then expressing it in a very funny way. And Gilda Radner, one of my other picks, had the same talent. She could morph into a child and jump up and down on a bed and pretend she's in a big giant rocking chair and that sort of thing. And Pee Wee Herman was, um, he was a person that always made me laugh. When I saw the show, I could always find something funny in everything he did, including the adult humor that he threw in just for the adults in the audience. Uh, and a lot of it was risque and uh, double entendre and, and maybe even triple entendre. <laughs> so I, uh, I admired him for his intellect and for his ability to make people laugh. I don't admire his um, personal character flaws that got him into big trouble with um, – all kinds of people. So I'm not endorsing him 100%, but I'm just saying that this is one person that if I were to see it in his best moments, I would still laugh quite loudly and, and hysterically because he was very inventive and, and he was spontaneous also. 
So he could make things appear to be unrehearsed. They might have been, but I don't know if. Uh, but he was very good at at at, at, um, at, 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 at pr- putting forward his uh, his momentary personality, and he could take a. He was quick to take a take on a situation, and then make that into a funny situation. So I, I really. I, I quite uh, enjoyed his humor. So according to Wikipedia, Pee Wee Herman is his, is the character he created, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. That is exactly the, right. The so, com- comedian is Paul Rubens, right? That's right. Okay. His big movie was Pee Wee's Big Adventure, and mm-hmm. uh, it was about somebody who stole his bicycle, and he spent the rest of the movie trying to find out who it was. Hmm. I, I won't spoil it for you if you want to watch it. <laughs> oh, that's, that reminds me of The Bicycle Thief. Oh, yes, of course, of course, of course. He probably based it on that. You know, he's that kind of a person that would have picked up on that right away. Uh, What were you going to say? I was just going to say that, uh, yes, I am aware of that movie as someone who was uh, a child (laughs) when all of his things were as a child were being made. Of course. And it was a funny movie, right? He was he has lots of funny characters. He has a, a genie, just a head, a talking head. <laughs> and Miss Wyvon, his love of his life, and uh, the postman that comes by, he creates a whole set of characters, and then uh, they all stayed in character throughout the whole show. It was, it was quite uh, quite ingenious, I thought. And, you know, when, when our kids were growing up, they, they watched him a bit, but I always thought it was a bit creepy. I don't creepy? Know. Yeah, it was a little creepy, I thought. Really? Okay. But I take it you don't like clowns either. <laughs> I find clowns creepy. <laughs> I never thought of that, but if they're a good clown, I guess they could be okay. They could be really Enjoy. talented. A really good clown is amazing, you know? I'm like Emmett to... Kelly. Yeah. Emmett right. Kelly, I could, yeah. one of those pe- I could have picked one of those people, too. Emmett there Kelly, was. I saw it because as a kid, I, my parents used to take me to the circus. The Ringling the Brothers, yeah, sure. Ringling Brothers, and he was there, right? Or somebody oh. that looked like him. But um, I, I think other kinds of comedy are like mime is really amazing, right? Oh, I would agree. I would totally and, agree. Um, you know, I was walking down the street, and always in New York, there's a guy just standing there frozen, right? <laughs> yes. And it's a Statue going, of Liberty or something. And people right. are going up to them, and, mm-hmm. and they're all Wondering painted. Wondering if it's real or not. They're <laughs> painted <laughs> silver or color or gold yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, they don't move at all. And that's pretty amazing, right? right? No, and then suddenly they'll spooky. move one hand and push it up against the glass and then not move. I find that amazing. <laughs> but these have been your picks. I appreciate them, Dixon. And now you will have to go back to normal. I have to return to something else. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the whole series. It's been illuminating to hear your take on each of these individuals. Well, it's it's my pleasure to present them to, a, to a, a, a naive audience that can now um, get a, a different way of laughing. Yeah. How's that? Brianne, what do you have for us? Um, so I have an astronomy pick of the day from earlier this week. It's from Wednesday. And it is just an absolutely beautiful image of the Pleiades um, oh, right. in really great detail, um, in much better uh, resolution, of course, than uh, anything else I've ever seen. And I just thought that was a gorgeous image. Oh, wow. It's beautiful. Yeah. It looks like a painting almost. It really does. Uh, I was just... I, I felt like I needed to look at my computer and open new tabs quite frequently because I wanted to see it again and again. And there are, there are a lot more than seven there. I don't get the seven sisters. Uh, come on. Yeah. <laughs> must be 25 stars There's in this at, picture. At least they're just so fantastic. Hmm. They're beautiful. Yeah. They're Very nice. Beautiful. Lovely. APOD is always a good pick. It really is. <clears throat> So now I am also finished with my 10 seminal papers uh-huh. on molecular biology, which was like a foil to your picks, Dixon, you know? Yes, yes. Like you were funny and I was serious, correct? But with meat. <laughs> so now I'm going back to regular picks. And I want to pick a book that I had, I read many years ago, and I, <clears throat> I had to purchase it as a used, and it was very expensive uh, at the time. But uh, I wanted to read it. So it's called The History of Poliomyelitis by J.R. Paul. And huh. you may have to search for this. I found one copy on Amazon, which looks like it's a library copy. You know, it has the special cover with the printed title on it. Um, and it's 
forty nine dollars. So that's paid, not so bad. I paid one hundred forty <laughs> years ago because I wanted it. I had yeah, read it exactly. in the library, but it's unfortunately it's out of print, and so you have to buy somebody else's copy. But if you can search down a copy of this. This is a terrific history. So Jared Powell himself was a scientist who worked on polio. And this history covers as far back as we had the original, what we think were original sightings of polio in, in uh, you know, ancient era through the discovery of the virus, through trying to make vaccines and failing all the way up to 1955 when Salk's vaccine was licensed. And, and not much after that, unfortunately, it doesn't go into the Sabin vaccines or eradication or anything like that. But you get to know the players, you know, the, the personalities, you get to know the science and what happened. It is, right. It's the basis of a, a great deal of what I know about the history of polio. And it's just wonderful. It's an excellent book. And nice. if you really like the history of viruses, I try and find one. Um, I didn't look other than in Amazon to find a link for you, but I'm sure you can find one uh, elsewhere. That, looks, that sounds very cool. And it sounds like, Vincent, you should write, you know, a second volume yeah. with all of the history after that. Well, you know, how, what was the publishing date on this one? Yeah, this is quite old. This is... Um, 60s? Let me see if I could find it. It doesn't even say it on the book page here. Hmm. Yeah, it might be 60s or 70s. J.R. Paul, History just, of Polio. Let's see if we can just find it outside of Amazon. 1971. <clears throat> ah. What, what were you doing in 1971, Vincent? Um, 1971, I was in college. Ah. I was a sophomore at Cornell. I graduated right. in 74, yeah. Right. I was right. in I was in high school in the sixties, sixty six through seventy. Is that right? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> How would we know? <laughs> oh, the sixties were were an interesting time for sure. Oh, absolutely. I was um, in the fifties. My my high school was in the fifties, but uh, the college in the sixties was very interesting. It was like, yeah, of uh, course it was. Nineteen sixty-eight, famously uh, riots, riots, and so forth, occupying uh, exactly. Columbia. The the president's office was taken over by Mark Rudman. Exactly. And Students for a Democratic Society, the SDS. Right. Which, Remember Grayson Kirk? Grayson was Kirk the was the president. Yeah, and he was quoted as saying, and this was quoted in the Times. He said, "This would be a hell of a university if it wasn't for the students." <laughs> <laughs> the next day, he read about the fact that he had been fired by the board of trustees. Well, he should be. That's not a way to raise money, which is the prime <laughs> function of a president of a university, That's to right. raise well, money for the university. And I know many true. presidents will disagree with me, but you no, are no, the I, face of fundraising. None will, none will disagree. The, none. the nuts and bolts – um, the provost typically does, yeah, right? that's right. That's right. Tenure that's right. and so forth. <clears throat> so – Anyway, this um, is a lovely history to try and find. And Brian, you suggested that uh, there were there was a time pre-TWIV that I thought about writing the the history since this book. Yeah, that would be mm -hmm. really interesting. That but, would be really interesting. So I will but, look for this book, but then I'll be waiting for yours. Just, I just that would be a huge effort to do that. And I do want to write my own account of virology. Oh, just all of virology, Brienne. I want to write a kind of mixed personal versus virology history. That sounds cool. Um, where one chapter would be what I did and the next chapter is virology history and give it a more, you know, interesting approach rather than just reciting history because I had a history in virology, right? So mm -hmm. you still I'm, do. Not, I'm not sure. <laughs> I still do, yes. I'm not sure I'm going to do that. Um, if I can get some people working with Microbe TV and offload some of the um, technical stuff, I might. I might. I do like writing very much. I still blog once a week, you know. So anyway, history of polio. We have we have two listener picks. By the way, last week, Dixon, one of the listener picks, the guy yelled at me for getting your website wrong all the time. 
Which website did you get wrong? Well, he says, I always say the livingriver.com. He said, it's it's the livingriver.org. And he said, you should know because you made it for him. <laughs> it, it is org. It is org. That's true. That's- and then I said, you misspelled Dixon's name because he misspelled your name. You should know better. <laughs> Uh, Richard writes, congratulations on 501c3 status. I'm a nonprofit finance guy from way back and want to point out that donations to micro TV are tax deductible as of the day you applied for that status. Oh, so it might be good to let folks who have already donated to know what that date is. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I will. I should pull that out. So it's something like April, May of 2021. So... Oh, well, that's a good point, Richard. That is really important because people have given money since then and they, they would love to hear that. Um, okay, I'm going to find that out and tell people next time. All right, I also want to submit a listener pick. This YouTube channel helps people talk to folks that might be, what shall I say, rationally challenged. <laughs> it's a good example of how he advises people to talk to the vaccine hesitant and gives a, a link to that. Note that he cautiously avoids terms that raises hackles in certain folks. Unfortunately, these days, that includes terms like COVID. Go figure. <laughs> anyway, this is 11 and a half minutes long, worth the watch. A lot of his stuff is more about politics and such, but when he talks about the public health situation, he offers some good communication tips. P.S. I've been listening, watching for over a year now, and in that time, I've gone back and taken all of the pandemic era twivs as well as the Q&As with a and I've watched the list of your greatest hits episodes what, recommended by Rich Condit a, well, a while back. It's been a welcome and unexpected educational upside to the pandemic. You are providing an invaluable resource, and I'll keep at it. I'm currently working through the Kurzgesagt immune book to prepare for your next round of live virology Lectures. I am just a nonprofit bean counter in Portland, Oregon, where it's foggy, two degrees C, 36F, this November morning. Brian, did you get your copy of that book yet? I did get my copy of that book, and I brought it here with me um, so that I'm reading it while I'm here over break. Are you going to be your pick at some point, or you already that picked is, it, I think? I have not. I picked a video uh, made by the same group. Um, but I need to finish reading the book and then it will probably be my pick. So would you recommend it for a, a beginner in immunology? That That's what I'm getting. Um, but I, I do want to finish getting all the way through it before I uh, officially make any recommendations. But that's sort of the idea. Yes. So do you think I should read it? <laughs> Um, I think if you want to learn more general immunology, maybe, but I do think, you know, a fair amount of, uh, more in-depth immunology. Than I mean, I have Jane, the, I've read Jane ways, you know, so. Yeah, it, it might not, uh, not quite involve the level you need. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Also, we have a listener pick from Sherry. I've been a huge fan of TWIV going back to the Ebola days. I'm also devoted to immune TWIP, TWIVO, et cetera. Never miss Q&A with a and V. I desperately searched YouTube for it last Wednesday while I was cooking dinner, only to realize you'd switch to Thursday. I was a theater major in college, but one of these days I'll sit down and seriously take Vincent's online virology course. My son has just started studying bugs, the other kind at Rutgers. (laughs) Maybe we need a This Week in Entomology. Well, actually, there is a, the anthro, what is it? The arthropod cast, right? Yes, that is the Arthur Podcast. The Arthur Podcast. <laughs> it's Arthro Podcast. Um, we had him on Twip, uh, the Arthro Podcast show. Yes, with um, who's the host? Arthro Podcast. Yeah, it's very good. Um, I can't. I can't figure out his name, but he uh, does the, It's it's very good. We had him on Twip Dixon because I think he was an advisor for your parasitic diseases book you sent oh, Daniel Daniel sent it to him to make sure the uh, arthropodology was okay oh I know who you mean I do know who you mean yes indeed so the arthropodcast which is a perfect name and so there you go sure. All right, I continue. also really like the word arthropodology that you just used arthropodology that's right I couldn't think of the right word Brian. <laughs> I know, but I, I think arthropodology ought to be a word now. I like it. <laughs> that's right. That's right. What is the study of arthropods? Is there a word? 
I, no, uh, I mean, I think part of it's entomology, but I think that no, it's entomology, sort yeah. of oh, there's general, a bunch you know, of it. invertebrate zoology. and all kinds right. of other biology. This means jointed legs. All it means is jointed legs. Yeah, yeah, I understand. So, so crabs have jointed legs, right? They sure do. So it goes beyond entomology, right? Oh, way beyond. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's part of general invertebrate zoology. It's a subset. It's a subset. Right, so we could make a field of arthropodology. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Could. You could. All right. Anyway, continuing with Sherry. Anyway, a friend showed me this video last night, and I thought I'd pass it on. The Marsh family started making song parodies during lockdown, and this one is about getting vaccinated, sung to the tune of Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah. <laughs> it made me cr laugh and nearly cry. Came out last January, so it's not brand new, but it's new to me and still sadly relevant. Hope you enjoy. I, I think I've seen this one, too. It's very good. Um, the family, yeah, the, it's the family – and the, the dad is sometimes cueing the daughters and they're like, hey, leave me alone. I know what I'm doing. Right. <laughs> My deepest gratitude to you all for your generosity and William wisdom. All the best. Sherry, who is an author, you can go to SherryHolman.com to see her books. Cool. Let's see, nice. let's see what Sherry writes. A novelist and screenwriter. Cool. Oh, nice. Oh, look at that. A Stolen Tongue was her first novel. 1997. Thank you, Sherry. Oh, nice look. <laughs> All right. That'll do it for TWIV 835. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIV. You can send your questions, comments, listener picks to TWIV at microbe.tv. And if you like what we do, I hear that when people like something, they enjoy supporting it. <laughs> I do too. You're correct. <laughs> and so if you like what we do, consider supporting us. Uh, there are two ways. You know, you could go to parasiteswithoutborders.com and for, what is it, December Janu and January now, because oh, November is almost over. Uh, Daniel will match your donation and give it back to Microbe TV. Or you could d donate to us at microbe.tv. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. Your, your donations are tax deductible, federal, U.S. And apparently since... I filed the application, which I will have to get the date for you <laughs> and figure that out. Um, it's probably right here on my computer, but I don't want to take the time to do this. So you can back deduct all your deductions for most of 2021. And if you really would, if you really love us, you not love uh, us. I mean, you might not like me, but somebody else you might like. <laughs> some people like some of us better than others. That's fine. It's like having a favorite child. Um, if you really love us, you could give us a lot of money and we'd love you a lot. <laughs> but if you want to give a thousand dollars or more, uh, by the end of 2020, 2021, uh, I'll give you, I'll send you a signed copy of parasites. No, not parasites. Principles of no. virology. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Principles of virology. I uh, will sign it and you, I will write an inscription to you. And there, I'm sure some of you who would like to have such a thing. Um, so if you want to do that, I, I'm going to make a web page. Uh, but until then, Vincent at microbe.tv. Dixon de Pommier is at thelivingriver.org. And trichinella.org. And trichinella what? Org also? Trichinella. I think it's dot org also. Yeah, that's right. Trichinella.org. Yep. There well, it is. Oh, what a beautiful image on that homepage. Look at yeah. this. I have to show it to you guys. This is camera number two. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> Ooh, yeah, yes, it's it is. Think? It's a scanning electron micrograph of a muscle larva that's been released it's, from its nurse cell. And if you click here, I figured out how to make it go to the next page. Yow. I actually figured that out. Wow. Look at that. Dixon. Look at that. That's really something. Anyway, trichinella.org, thelivingriver.org. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent. You're welcome, Virian. And I, I hope you both had a nice Thanksgiving because <laughs> I did too. That was very nice. It was very nice. Uh, Good. Brianne Barker is at Drew University Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thank you, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. I hope you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving too. Um, probably it's time to eat some more stuffing soon. Exactly. And when are you coming back on Sunday? Uh, Saturday. Okay. So drive safely, Brianne. Thank you. Exactly. I hear you're a fast driver. Really? <laughs> really? Am I? <laughs> I asked you once and you said, yeah, you like to drive fast. 
Yeah, I'm a medium. I don't know. Sure, I'll be a fast driver. Just put it on autopilot. You'll be fine. <laughs> you don't have a Tesla, do you? I do not have a Tesla. That would be cool. Yeah, you could put it on auto drive, right? I could. No, don't do that. Don't do that. No? No, I don't trust any of those. Still be there to keep an eye on the Tesla. <laughs> yeah, you're supposed to keep your hands on the wheel, apparently. When you well, then what fun is that? You should be able to go to sleep and then <laughs> wake up at home. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a ways off. Could, yeah, you, could you really sleep in the back seat with autopilot? You, you, you wouldn't, Dixon. You'd be too nervous. Good Lord, I would never even put it on autopilot. No, but no, I, bet, no. I think cruise control, yes. Yeah, for a highway, cru cruise control is fine. Yeah. Yeah. It's very good. All that right. way you're guaranteed not to get a ticket. Well, I would set it above. I would set it five miles, miles, <laughs> five miles per hour above the speed limit, right? Well, no, no, that's legal. That's totally legal. Yeah. I'm Vincent Rackenell. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV. And of course, all of your support, which we greatly appreciate, and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.